Chapter 5 Our World and Our Water Are Changed by Prayer When I was a child, I had a recurring nightmare. The ground shook beneath my feet and a volcano spewed out red-hot lava. I'm not sure... ...when this started recording, so I will start again. Chapter 5. Our world and our water are changed by prayer. When I was a child, I had a recurring nightmare. The ground shook beneath everything, knocking over houses and buildings like blocks, and all the people ran about screaming as the earth moaned. There was a time when it seemed like I had this dream every night. I'm no longer bothered by the dream. In fact, it stopped when I published my first book of water crystals. But I suspect I have seen the dream thousands of times over the years. Sometimes it scared me so much that I jumped out of bed wide awake and ready to run for my life. To this day, I still don't know the meaning of the dream or why I saw it over and over. I know it was just a dream, but that scene of hell still lurks in my memory as if it were real. The turn of the century seemed to be a time of particular uncertainty and instability. One of the outcomes was a greater interest in spiritual matters. Yes, we survived July 1999, the month when Nostradamus said the world would be destroyed, and 2000 came and went without all our computers turning against us. While many people can recall a feeling that something dreadful was about to happen, many others believe that we stood at the brink of a period in human history when all the knowledge and wisdom of the ages just might culminate to create a golden age. And those who didn't have such a feeling at least hoped for such a future, but the hopefulness wasn't to last long. September 11, 2001 came and nothing was the same. The flames of war ignited in the Middle East, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Israel. The first page of our new hope-filled century was stained with blood. Then came the devastating Indian Ocean tsunami in December 2004 and Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and I recalled the nightmare of my childhood. There have always been people who believe the end of the human race, the destruction of the world, and global catastrophe are imminent. I don't believe such a bleak future is waiting for us, and I've always tried to take a stand against such negative predictions. The reason for my optimism is that I feel that the words engraved in our hearts might just have an effect on the direction in which the world is moving. But I must admit that it sometimes does seem that the world is taking the steps which will lead straight to the destruction of the human race. No matter how positive you try to be, it's hard to ignore the fact that we are faced by an avalanche of problems of our own creation. With the global population expected to explode by 1.5 times in the next 50 years and 4 times in the next 100 years with rapid industrialization, with the condition of the environment deteriorating at a rapid pace, our survival is uncertain. Some reports say that a temperature increase of between 4 and 6 degrees centigrade within 100 years will increase the ocean level by 80 to 150 centimeters and flood much of the land we currently inhabit. And there's no guarantee that the change will be gradual. Large islands in the South Seas are already now slipping into the ocean. The rising of the oceans combined with a tsunami similar to the one we just witnessed could wipe out many of the great cities and ensure civilizations in some parts of the, and entire civilizations in some parts of the world. Instable weather patterns are another concern. Unusual downpours and droughts are re wrecking, wreaking havoc with the world's food supply. I sometimes wonder if the recurring dream I saw as a child wasn't more than just a child's dream. What could we possibly do to change this course even slightly? One solution is to change the way we live and the structures and systems that form society. Environmental Concerns In Chapter 3, I discussed the destructive repercussions of blocking the flow of water. We see the same results when we interfere with the delicate circle of life that forms ecosystems. One of the first warning bells was the book Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, who revealed that pesticides such as DDT pollute the water and push entire species of birds and fish to the brink of extinction. Silent Spring told the story of how the insecticide dieldron was sprayed in and around Sheldon, Illinois in order to eradicate the Japanese beetle in that area and stop its northern progression. 
The chemicals seeped into the ground, killing or driving out all the beetles and other insects. After eating the insects or bathing in the polluted water, the death of robins, pheasants, and starlings came next, followed by the deaths of squirrels, rabbits, and then 90% of farm cats. Even sheep could not escape the fatal effects of the chemicals. Carson also revealed the impact of the chemicals on the salmon and trout in rivers and the rising cancer rate in humans, but all this didn't stop the state and federal governments from spraying stronger and stronger insecticides for years to come. As expected, her work earned protests from the agrochemical industry. They made fun of the book and labeled her a hysterical woman. But when Carson appeared in the press to defend herself, her logic and her dignity made an even deeper impression on the viewers. Eventually, this led to the government being forced to admit that she was right. Carson's good judgment and courage reaches beyond her time and has just as much to teach us today. Her books should be required reading for anyone living in these times. Carson sounded an early warning about the potential risk of pollution, but she also warned us about the chain effect that results when a link of the circle of life is broken. We have already seen where the removal of bugs or weeds by chemical means can lead to the extinction of a vast area of other forms of life, including the microorganisms that live in the soil. And when the soil has died, then the perpetual use of chemicals becomes necessary to continue farming. Once the natural circle of life is broken, putting it back together is next to impossible. Some 40 years have passed since Rachel Carson first warned us about the effects of pesticides. Have we seen any improvement in the situation? In advanced countries, at least, the use of DDT, dieldrin, and other chemicals that Carson warned us about have been banned, and for the most part discontinued. But deplorably, these chemicals are still sold to other countries that haven't banned them yet. In our pursuit for profit and convenience, we have closed our eyes to the cycle of life that has formed over the eons. So much of what we do threatens to end this cycle and create a new cycle of waste and destruction. Ever increasing materialism. Do you ever get the feeling that society in general and you in specific are moving at a faster pace than 10 or 20 years ago? It's not likely that the hands of our clocks have sped up, but our perception of time certainly has. Imagine that the world is an enormous spinning top. We'll call it the top of materialistic culture. As culture develops and we acquire more and more, the top gets bigger and bigger. This is how life goes in our materialistic state. Each year, sales have to increase, incomes have to rise, and, eco and economies have to expand. We're made to think that staying the same or slowing down will lead to recession, depression, and failure. Goals achieved lead to the setting of higher goals and requirements to work ever harder and faster. Ever loyal, we have labored diligently to expand the size of the spinning top. And we at the edge of this top must travel an increasingly wider distance to make one rotation. While a small top might complete a rotation in one second, a top twice as large or a thousand times larger would take much longer to go around once. While a small top may rotate a few centimeters per second, a larger top may travel a few meters. The speed of the hands on your clock are going at the same speed, but the rate at which change takes place is speeding up, and perhaps someday the spinning top will go so fast that we'll no longer be able to hang on. How can we slow down this spinning top? I know of only one way, and that is to cast aside our fast-paced materialistic lifestyles. In other words, our continued sojourn on this planet will require that we pack lighter. It's just that simple. You may believe that you can get more accomplished in less time if you live your life in overdrive, but for most people it ends up meaning working harder and harder in a job they like less and less. As society expands and infrastructures become more complicated, the role of the individual is increasingly delegated to a minuscule piece of a vast machine, Feeling powerless to make a difference, people resign themselves to doing what they are told to do and nothing more. But the greatest steps forward can often be made by becoming smaller instead of bigger, by going slower instead of faster. Within an organization, workers are able to expand their abilities only to the limits of the box within which they function. In many large companies with compartmentalized divisions, the scope of most people is limited to the task at hand. With only a small role to perform within a large box, the importance and value of each role is minimal, 
as is the employee's perspective and need to develop his or her abilities. But when the size of the box that people function within is reduced, the role of the people within the box becomes more important and valuable. And knowing this, most people will strive to expand their skills and abilities. They get to know their coworkers, communication improves, and motivation increases. Ideas that were formerly obscured by the complexities of the big organization would emerge and innovations would revolutionize the organization. Young employees in the company would see hope and be motivated by their unlimited potential to move up in the company. The concept that smaller is better applies not only to companies. These same results could be seen in governments and all other organizations in society. A changing sentiment. More and more people are beginning to understand that bigger and faster is not necessarily better. It is becoming clearer that continually piling unreasonable greed and demand on top of each other leads to destruction rather than success. It's not unusual to see financial institutions, construction companies, and retailers fighting for their survival. We might even say that the destruction of the World Trade Center was symbolic of a broader change taking place in our society. Of course, the terrorist at attacks were a heinous crime, but one reason the Twin Towers in New York were targeted by the terrorists was because they were a symbol of the global economy and one of the most enormous building complexes ever built. I believe that its collapse has played a role in moving us humans toward the theory of E.F. Schumacher, who advocates small is beautiful in his new economics with humans in its center. Many people today are coming together to form communities beyond the typical definitions of neighborhood and village. In Europe, the United States, Australia, and other parts of the world, communities are forming with the aim of li living peacefully with the environment. These communities take various forms, but they all have the basic goal of separating themselves from consumer-based lifestyles and becoming self-sufficient. Another aspect of this trend is the slow food movement and the rising voice against the drive for standardization promoted by globalism. In recent years, we've also heard talk of new regional currencies and the drive to implement systems that return to focusing on the exchange of goods and labor of equal value instead of the continual expansion of speculation that is going on now. This is another way that we are returning to the fundamentals of the concept of community. A natural renewable alternative to oil. One thing that these new old concepts of community have in common is concern for the environment. For a long time, oil has been a source of major concern and conflict for the world. Most world economies are powered by oil, as are many of the wars going on in the world. And that's to be expected. Energy is at the foundation of all cultures. We owe our comfortable lifestyles to our ability to procure sufficient amounts of it. We can keep the neon lights on all night. There's always a store open nearby to feed our hunger and our desire of the moment. But what will happen to us when the last drop of oil is used up? The lights will go out and our appliances will be useless. But it won't matter because we won't be able to transport food to our tables. The foundation supporting us is frail indeed. If it's not cramping our style today, then we tend to think it's a problem for someone else. But now in times of abundance is when we should be laying the foundation for the survival of future generations. We need to be looking for something to replace oil and the oil-based products that we so rely on. One possible alternative that has caught my attention is hemp. Nature provides for us in many wonderful ways, so we should look to nature first for solutions to our challenges. The hemp plant can provide many of the things that humankind requires in order to survive on this planet. From its stalk, paper, cloth, and even plastic can be produced. Four times more paper can be made from an acre of hemp than from an acre of trees. The cloth made from hemp is much more gentle on the skin than chemical-soaked cotton, not to mention that hemp is free to four times more efficient than cotton as a crop. From the seed and stalk of the hemp, diesel fuel, methanol, and ethanol can be obtained without the byproducts of sulfur that causes acid rain and air pollution. Ford Motors has even made a car with a plastic body made from hemp that runs on hemp fuel. Hemp can also become an ideal source of human nourishment. The fruit of the hemp plant provides the same amount of protein found in soybeans and it is easy to digest. It also contains essential amino and fatty acids. The hemp seeds can also be used to make a healthy oil. 
Hua Ma Ren is the Chinese name for it, and it is widely used as herbal medicine. Its medical uses are numerous. Possible derivative products include an antibiotic, antidepressant agent, pain reliever, and headache medicine. It's also reported to have shown dramatic results in the treatment of cancer, AIDS, rheumatism, and skin rashes. Hemp can also be used to make shampoos and cosmetics because of its moisturizing characteristics. Another feature that makes hemp attractive is its rapid growth rate. In 110 days, the plant will reach a height of 2 or 3 meters, making it possible to harvest several crops in a single season. In Japan, it's said that ninja would use hemp to improve their jumping skills. When the plant first started to grow, they could easily jump over the top of it, but as it grew taller day by day, it required more and more effort and skill to clear. As the hemp plant grows, it converts carbon dioxide into oxygen at a faster rate than almost any other plant. The amount of carbon dioxide taken in by hemp is pound for pound three to four times more efficient than deciduous leaves. From a hado perspective, hemp is good for the environment because it has positive hado. In fact, hemp's high rate of growth is what enables it to grow so quickly. It is a gift of nature that could come to our rescue just when we need it. Hemp is woven into the fabric of America's history. It's said that without hemp to make ropes and sails, Columbus would have never been able to make the trip across the ocean. Even the Declaration of Independence is written on hemp paper. You could even find hemp growing on George Washington's farm. Unfortunately, there are misconceptions about hemp because of its relation to marijuana or cannabis, which is illegal in many parts of the world. Despite this, there has been a grassroots reawakening in recent years to the potential uses of hemp. In July 2001, the hemp car, a biodiesel car running on fuel from the seed of the hemp plant, left Washington, D.C. and started on a trip across America to promote the benefits of hemp as a resource. The efforts to attract attention to this amazing new source of fuel were going well until the news was buried by the events of September 11. In Japan as well, a hemp car also crossed the country in 2002. A man named Yasunio Nakamaya has made it his life's calling to promote the use of hemp. He says that he sees hemp as essential for the survival of the human race. As a teenager, Nakamaya-san came close to drowning and had a near-death experience. The young man found himself surrounded by light in another world where people were going about their lives. He saw plants with beautiful leaves and recognized a wonderful sense of healing coming from the plant. When he came to, the experience made him think in a deep way about the purpose of life. Several years had passed when Nakamaya-san encountered the plant that he had seen in his out-of-body experience. There was no doubt in his mind that this was the plant which would help him understand the mysteries of life and the universe. The plant, of course, was hemp, and since that time, Nakamaya-san has made the study of hemp his life's work. Japan's version of the hemp car left a small city in the northern tip of Japan with its destination, the Hyatite Shinto Shrine in Kumamoto Prefecture. In place of gas and the diesel engine, hemp oil was used. This biodiesel fuel emits no sulfur dioxide, and only one-third the amount of toxic smog emitted by petroleum fuel. During his journey, Nakamaya-san visited many places related to hemp, including the Hemp Road of Japan, that served as the network tying together an ancient self-sustaining society. In ancient days in Japan, many trade routes linked the country. Along with routes for salt, sugar, silk, and other products, there were also routes for transporting hemp. If you drive the hemp road, you can see the traces that ancient Japan had an abundant self-sustaining society, which was based on a solar worship. The Shinto Religion and Hemp <clears throat> On its long journey through Japan, the hemp car made stops at the many Shinto shrines in Japan where hemp is considered to have special significance. Their ultimate destination, the Hyatite Shrine, is considered the oldest shrine in Japan, even its name comes from the ancient Japanese word for hemp. From ancient times, hemp played an important role in Shinto beliefs and practices. It was considered to have many powers, including the power to purify and cast out evil spirits. I suspect that one reason the ancients revered cannabis so much was its rapid rate of growth, indicating a high vibration rate. 
This enabled it to drive out evil impurity and other forms of low vibration. Hemp's many uses in the temples included the braided ropes around sacred trees and the bell rope used to wake the gods at the entrance of the shrine. At the Icy Temple, the most sacred of all Shinto shrines, ancient cannabis is preserved along with the sacred mirror serving as emblems of the body of Amaterasu, the founding goddess of Japan. A sacred Amaterasu talisman is referred to as the Shrine Cannabis, and each year ceremonies take place according to the sacred cannabis calendar. The ancient Shinto religion of Japan can be described as a religion of vibration. It has no founder, no teachings, no sacred writings, and no ceremonies or practices with the aim of causing an awakening or rebirth. Shintoism is mostly about raising the vibration rate to drive out negative forces, thus creating holy spaces. It is said that the sites for ancient tem temples were chosen in areas of pristine nature that emitted a high energy level. Shinto does not claim one founder or one god. Mountains, rivers, oceans, animals, trees, and flowers are all gods, and along with people, all elements of a single, unified universe. The soul of Shintoism is harmony. In nature, nothing is inferior and nothing is superior. All things are given a role and responsibility, and one part of the universe serves all other parts by best being who and what it is. Perhaps the bountiful and beautiful nature of Japan had something to do with the emergence of such a concept. With the beauty, colors, sounds, and scents of four distinct seasons, the Japanese have become sensitive to the nature around them, making it possible to see multiple gods within nature and leading to the formation of a culture that promotes the richness and sacredness of vibration. When prayer touches water... The Shinto prayers, referred to as Norito, are for the purpose of creating vibration, which will link us to the sacred. I have previously written that the Hado from a certain type of voice can have the effect of prayer and healing. I have had many experiences of praying over water with the locals in places such as Lake Baiwa, the largest lake in Japan, in Lucerne, Switzerland, on the shores of Lake Zurich in the Bahamas, and in other parts of the world. In every case, there was a striking difference in the crystals made from water collected before the prayer and after the prayer, and the subsequent crystals were always beautiful and glorious. Words spoken from a heart filled with prayer takes on the form of Hado, and this leads to a new world being eternally created. Your world becomes different when things are created in a whole new way. The Shinto prayer is not a prayer to the one and only, but a prayer to myriad holy beings. What could we mean by myriad holy beings? From the perspective of Hado, it is possible to form an idea. Consider the fact that there are some sounds that can be perceived by the human ear and others that cannot. The highest sound that humans can hear is about 20 kilohertz, but there are certainly sounds that exist in a higher range than that, and we refer to the sound level as ultrasound. The same concept can be applied to light. The light spectrum visible to the human eye has as an electromagnetic wave of between 380 and 780 nanometers, and anything outside of this range cannot be seen, but electromagnetic waves above 780 nanometers do exist. <coughs> Excuse me. This principle applies to all our senses, or perhaps we should say that what we can feel with our senses is only a small part of our world. The blind bat uses ultrasound that the human ear cannot hear to avoid hitting cave walls. A dog can distinguish between scents that are beyond our detection. Many animals have almost supernatural abilities. Considering these facts, it would not be too much of a stretch of the mind to say that there are types of consciousness and life forms that are beyond our limited ability to sense. Perhaps it would not be so strange to believe in the existence of higher frequency consciousness without a physical body like ours. If there is such a being, I suspect that it may exist in a parallel universe with our own world. When a vibration is doubled, it is possible to create a new set of sounds one octave higher, and with each case of doubling, the octave goes higher and higher until we reach a set of sounds too high for the human ear to hear. In the same way, rocks, grass, animals, and people all vibrate at their own rate and in octaves we are in tune with, 
and so it shouldn't be too difficult to surmise the existence of an equivalent frequency in octaves that are off our own scale of sensitivities. Within this line of theory, perhaps we can then come up with a description of the gods of all of creation. Perhaps we can form a link between ourselves and a higher being. The method I speak of is, of course, prayer. Our Common Consciousness No one I personally know has seen the face of a deity, although I recognize there are people who say they have had this experience. All we can do is gather evidence and consider it. By considering it based on the principles of Hato, I believe considerable progress is possible in this realm. If you examine any culture, ancient or modern, you'll find that everyone has somehow arrived at a concept of deity. Genetic engineers, physicists, and other scientists who have reached to the edges of their fields become enraptured by the magnificence and order of nature and thus become convinced of some unseen hand at work in the creation. My own path to this understanding was shown to me by water crystals. Water has shown me in a very real way how prayer can change the world. No one particular religion has been able to secure the exclusive rights for the power of prayer. No matter who we are, we all have the ability to take advantage of this amazing and wonderful power. Once you realize this, you will then be filled with the desire to help others realize this as well. More and more people are resonating with this understanding, and this could result in a more wonderful future for humankind. In my presentations, I mentioned that I have another interpretation of Einstein's theory of relativity repre represented by the formula E equals mc squared. C represents consciousness, M represents mass, the number of people, and when the, the number of people with an awakened consciousness founded in the desire to make the world a better place increases, the result is an exponential increase in E, or energy. Earlier in this book, I talked about Professor Hideo Higa, who developed the unique microorganism EM. He explained to me that within the world of microorganisms, 10% of microorganisms are harmful, but there are also only 10% of beneficial microorganisms. He refers to the remaining 80% as wait-and-see microorganisms. They watch until either the good or the bad microorganisms emerges the victors, and then they join the stronger of the two. I find that there is a correlation in what goes on in human society. Within our society, there are people, about 10%, who have the ability and feel the call to make this world a better place. But many of these people have not yet become aware of their destiny. I am quite sure that as more and more of these people awaken and begin to employ their consciousness and prayer and action, the vast majority of the population, about 80%, will then also join their numbers. The water within us. We are well into the 21st century and blood continues to be shed. Especially painful to watch is the conflict between Palestine and Israel. How much life will have to be destroyed by ethnic fighting and holy war? Without an end to this horrendous conflict, it is hard to imagine a peaceful future for any of us. But it appears as if the hatred and loathing has over centuries slowly entered the very DNA of the two sides. I was once thinking about this when I suddenly realized the close relationship between DNA and water. DNA is structured by two chains and a spiral formed by a hydrogen bond. The consciousness of our ancestors is passed from one generation to the next through blood the water that circulates throughout our bodies, and the water that flows through the bodies of the Jews and Palestinians comes mostly from the Jordan River. The Jordan River flows southward from northern Palestine and connects the Sea of Galilee with the Dead Sea, forming the eastern border of Palestine. Along its way, it provides much of the water necessary for su sustaining life in the region. The power of prayer has the ability to reach far distances of space and time. Through the photographs of water crystals, I have strived to help people from around the world understand the power and wonder of prayer, and I have encouraged people everywhere to pray for peace in the world. I decided that I would ask people to join together on a particular day to send Hado of Love and Peace to the Sea of Galilee, which flows into the Jordan River. The people who drink its water would receive this halo, and their bodies would be filled with beautiful energy. Can you just imagine the possibilities for peace? 
Before I set the date, I discovered something quite surprising. Another name for the Sea of Galilee is Lake Kinneret, and Kinneret in Hebrew is the word for harp, the shape of the Sea of Galilee. And it also happens that Lake Biwa is named after the Biwa, a traditional harp-like instrument in Japan. Could the similarity be more than a coincidence? I decided to set the day for the special prayer for July 25th, 2003. As I mentioned in chapter 2, this day is very important in the 13-month calendar used by the Mayans. It is called the day out of time, the one extra day on the Mayan calendar. Even in this modern age, perhaps we have the spirit of this day buried within us. I intend to work towards making this an international day of prayer for expressing love and appreciation for water. A year prior to the date, I set for sending Hado to the Sea of Galilee. I established what I called a project of love and thanks to water. This was a project aimed at unifying the souls of people from around the world and raising consciousness on July 25, 2003. My first efforts focused on expanding the circle of people willing to participate in the prayer. I asked everyone I knew to do the following. On the 25th of each month, either at 7.25 in the morning or 7.25 in the evening, face a body of water and express your love and appreciation. You could do this anywhere, such as your kitchen or your bedroom. A glass of water would suffice. Gently say to the water, I love you and thank you. As you do this, imagine the power of love and appreciation flowing through you into all of the water of the world. All water, even the glass of water, is connected to all the rest of the water in the world. The halo of love and appreciation that you release will become streams of brilliant gold and silver light in the flowing water and reach out to the entire world, ultimately covering it in light. The result will be a testimony of the healing and harmonizing of our planet. Water carries within it your thoughts and your prayers, and as you yourself are water, no matter where you are, your prayers will be carried to the rest of the world. So pray. Pray for the victims of meaningless wars and landmines, for orphaned children, for the sick and the bedridden. There is much you can do from now on, and even a lot you can do at this very moment. I recall that horrible recurring dream I saw as a small child. It wasn't warning me about my fate to witness the gloom and doom of the human race. It was teaching me what I must do in life. But it wasn't a lesson for me alone. It was for you and for everyone else who reads this book. Fill your soul with love and gratitude. Pray for the world. Share the message of love. And let us flow as long as we live. That's so good.